Hi. Hi. So uh, let's wait a couple of uh, one to two minutes to have everyone join in. Oh, so. Hi everyone. Um, my our apologies for the slight delay earlier. So it's uh, about five minutes past the event uh, time. Um, but thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Vanessa Manuturi. I'm from Kotakita Foundation. Um, before, before we begin, uh, just a couple of house rules that I'd like to uh, share with you. So one, uh, you all of each of you would have probably uh, been notified that this meeting is being recorded and it is also being streamed on YouTube um, and its recording will likely be published afterwards. So if you are um, not comfortable with uh, the recordings or would prefer to remain uh, anonymous in the recording, please feel free to change your name or turn off your camera. So the second house rule is uh, please, of course, uh, ensure that your mic is turned off uh, during the session. Um, if you are comfortable, we invite you to turn on your camera, but if not, uh, feel free to join us by uh, uh, audio. Um, and second, uh, we will we do have English to Indonesian translators um, available and also Indonesian sign language translator, uh, translator uh, interpreters um, with us uh, this evening. Um, so feel free to turn on the interpretation features um, on the uh, screen below you. So you have options to choose Indonesian or and also with Indonesian sign language, you should be able to see a couple of interpreters um, on the screen. And lastly, um, related to questions, feel free to submit any questions that you have throughout the discussion in the chat box or, um, or in the Q&A box right away. And feel free to just uh, submit your questions throughout the session. You don't have to wait until the Q&A session. Um, so those are a couple of the house rules um, that perhaps I'd like to share with you. And with that, we can uh, start our event. So um, welcome to the Inclusive Planning and Design City Scale Strategies webinar for everyone. Um, this webinar is part of an overseas practice engagement uh, process between the social development practice at Bartlett Development Planning Unit, University College London, and Kotakita's Urban Citizenship Academy. So taking up insights and experiences from our collaboration in the past year, in this discussion, we'll be exploring strategies and advocacy for citywide inclusive development and efforts to support uh, persons with dis disability citizenship practices and their active involvement in city development processes. Um, we have an exciting lineup of moderator and panelists for this afternoon. Um, whom I'd like to introduce. Um, as moderator, we have Julian Walker, who is the co-director of the Master of Science program in social development practice uh, at the Bartlett Development Planning Unit, University College London. We'll also have uh, Riznawati Utami from Ohana, Indonesia, who, is, who will be joining us, and also Pong Cruz from World Ena Enabled. Um, and with that introduction, I'd like to hand over the session to Julian Walker as the moderator. Uh, feel free to continue, Julian. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Um, so just before we move into the two presentations from the two panelists that we're very pleased to have with us today, I just wanted to give a little bit of background about this research collaboration and the wider research project that it fits into. Um, 
Okay, can, I hope you can all see my screen. So this research collaboration that we're working on currently fits into a wider research project that's been going on for a couple of years called AT2030. And AT stands for Assistive Technologies. So this program is part of a wider program working to extend access to, to people who need or would benefit from using assistive technologies, by which we mean things like wheelchairs, hearing aids, um, uh, and so on. Our particular sub-project focuses on community-based interventions, particularly in informal settlements. And we've been working in Sierra Leone and in Indonesia with our local partners, Kotakita and Kakikota in Banjamasin in Kalimantan. And this project is focusing on the question, how can collective and community-led responses empower disabled people to access better life outcomes through increasing the relevance and uptake of assistive technologies. So we worked in two phases. The first phase from 2019 to 20 was mapping the as selected aspirations of people in the communities we were working with, both people with and without disabilities, um, and looking at the existing community-led responses that support the attainment of these aspirations. The second phase, which we're currently in, is based on the selective aspirations to co-produce and trial assistive technology interventions relevant to these aspirations and the community support environment that we mapped out in phase one. And in Banjamasin in Indonesia, collectively across the two communities that we've been working in, the choice of aspirations that our community partners wanted to work on were inclusive spaces and community engagement. And here you can see a photo of one of our research participants in Kelayan Barat in Banjamasin, who has a mobility impairment and had particular issues about being able to access or use public spaces because she lives in a community where public space is very limited and very heavily used by other traffic. So she was uncomfortable to use that. So this research collaboration between the Urban Citizenship Academy and the UCL students is building on this research. So this initial research focused particularly on four informal settlements, two in Freetown, Sierra Leone, and two in Banjamas in Indonesia. And we're hoping that this research engagement will give us a chance to expand beyond understanding the aspirations and actions from the neighborhoods in Banjamas in, in Indonesia, to look at definitions and priorities related to inclusive community spaces more broadly. And we're doing this during this field work by adding more cases in solo and also bringing in the perspectives of six organizations of persons with disability from across Indonesia. And one of the challenges here is to understand inclusive public space and community engagement, not looking at very particular sites, but looking more at the city scale. And we're really hoping that today's discussion will help us to think more about that. And we're very happy to have the perspectives of um, Risna from Ahana, which is an Indonesia-wide um, uh, OPD dealing with issues around helping people with mobility impairments, and Pong Cruz from World Enabled, which is based in the Philippines, but is engaging globally with issues to do with disability rights, particularly in relation to urban development. So having given a bit of context, I'd like to hand over to the first speaker. And I think, were we going to have Pong first? Yeah. So yeah. if I can hand over to Pong, he'll, he'll be talking for about 10 to 15 minutes um, about his perspective on city strategies and inclusion at the city scale. So Pong, I'll hand over to you. Great. Uh, thank you. So cities have the capacity to capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they're created by everybody. That's from, from Jane Jacobs, an urbanist and a, an activist uh, trying to promote um, inclusive cities. And uh, again, good, good afternoon to, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. One thing that we need to remember when we look at cities is, you know, there are 100,000, 100 million people moving to cities every year. And 
within this population, we have about 50% who are persons with disabilities. Some of them, uh, or a big, prior, uh, a big uh, chunk of these are also older persons. And if you look at the, um, we we'll look at the number, you'll get around 600 million people or people with disabilities who are living in the cities. And if you try to include their families and friends, you would be able to get about 2.15 billion people. And that can be converted into, you know, the economic value. That's about 640 billion US dollars of annual disposable income. That's how much we are losing every time we try to forget about people with disabilities and when we forget about inclusion. So what is uh, disability? If you look at it, it's, it's a function of the functional limitation plus the environment. And when I talk about functional limitation, this basically deals with, you know, you ask questions like, do you have difficulty seeing even when you're wearing glasses? Do you have difficulty hearing even with your hearing aid? Do you have difficulty walking or caring for yourself, uh, washing all over, dressing, feeding yourself? Uh, or do you have difficulty communicating, being understood or understanding others? And when I talk about the environment, this has three components. You have the physical environment, you have the social environment, and the institutional environment or the digital environment. And if you look at the iceberg of inequality, um, so imagine an iceberg and on top of it, on top of the um, surface of the water, most of the time we focus on the basic functionings uh, of individuals like health, habilitation or rehabilitation. You have social protection and safety nets. You also talk about education and employment. But focusing on those is basically scratching just the surface. So some of the things underneath or below the water are the basic freedoms that we, everyone uh, has to have. For example, uh, independent living, mobility, access, uh, political and public participation, awareness raising. These are also important, equally important as the basic uh, functionings. So let me give you um, a framework that was developed by uh, Victor Pineda, the founder and uh, also the president of World Enabled. We use this to, to analyze um, how inclusive a city or a country is for people with disabilities and older persons. Uh, and it's divided into to three parts. One is the cost, the next one is the context, and the third is the capacity. When you look at a cost, basically you're looking at the vision. What is the vision of the city? Does it want it to be inclusive for people with disabilities or for older persons? And a way for you to, an indicator for you to see if there's a vision from the city is by looking at their laws and their policies. And what we need to do here is to see if cities have localized their policies or commitments on, let's say, for people with disabilities and older persons. <clears throat> the next one is the context. Um, context basically is the, the environment. What authorizes the uh, that, that enables, what authority enables um, for policies to work within a city. So we look at 
we ask questions like, does the executive uh, branch or the leaders of the city support uh, the policies, inclusive policies? Second, are people with disabilities through their organizations able to participate in different activities of the city? And the third one, when you look at a context, what is the overall attitude of the city towards people with disabilities and older persons? Do they think that they should be part of the city or should they be excluded? The third part that we can look at when analyzing um, how inclusive a city is, is looking at the capacity. How much of the capacity of the city uh, how much how are they able to administer uh, the different programs and policies that they have for people with disabilities and older persons next we look at are they able do they have the capacity to coordinate all the efforts of the different stakeholders in within the city and the last one that when we look at the capacity is of course the budget, is there enough budget that the uh, city allocates for programs and policies for people with disabilities and older persons? And this framework, we've used this to, to also um, promote the rights of people with disabilities around the world. Uh, and one of the things that we've been doing for the last uh, four years is campaigning for inclusive and accessible urban uh, places. And in 2018, uh, World Enabled has led uh, a campaign that we call Cities for All um, campaign. And its main purpose is basically for the next uh, nine years until 2030, we wanted to um, transform 100 cities and make them inclusive, accessible, and resilient. And this has been led by uh, World Enabled, and we have par partner, partnered with um, Office of the Special Envoy on Accessibility, um, UN Habitat, uh, UCLG, uh, United Cities and Local Governments. We also have a partnership with a network of networks, which we call uh, the um, Disability Inclusive and Accessible Urban Development, or DIAUD, D-I-A-U-D. Um, and of course, we have a, not, uh, a network for uh, of city partners, like um, we also have CBM, uh, we also have World Bank Union, and, and IDA. So what are the general things that we do? what we basically do is try to uh, work with, try to mobilize uh, different stakeholders like decision makers, citizens, organizations of people with disabilities and older persons. And we work with them to one, we, we try to convene all these stakeholders, all these change makers. Next, we also try to collect uh, collect data and then carry out and also share the information and research that we gather from, from as a result of the data collection. And the third one is we try to develop tools and um, try to increase the capacity of our partner cities. And the Cities for All campaign is based on uh, a few uh, principles, six principles. The first is non-discrimination. This means that we try to serve everyone. We try to promote and try to encourage cities to serve everyone without discrimination. The second principle is accessibility. We try to convince cities to reach everyone um, through first, in the short run, try to uh, hopefully they, they try to provide reasonable accommodation. And then in the long run, 
hopefully they try to um, remove the barriers, the physical the environment and the digital barriers that people with disabilities and older persons uh, encounter. The third principle is participation. So what, what we try to encourage cities is to you know, serve everyone uh, equitably. This means giving more support to those who need more support and uh, including you know, people with disabilities and older persons. The next um, principle is inclusive urban policies and programs. What this means is basically trying to help cities localize their international and regional commitments on human rights and disability rights. The third, uh, the fifth one is capacity building. Uh, we try to maximize the resources by trying to strengthen the capacity of all the stakeholders. And the last one is data for development. And what we try to achieve here is try to use the data uh, to monitor and inform um, existing programs and policies, and then try to develop new programs and policies based on these data. So in a way, what we're trying to do is try to use the data to uh, make some policy changes and convert those data into uh, more actionable items. Currently, we have um, signatory cities like New York, Chicago, Berlin, uh, Amman, Sao Paulo, uh, Rio de Janeiro, we have also uh, Leon, Helsinki, Barcelona, Abu Dhabi, and in 2018, we had uh, Benjamin Nassim. And so if you ask us, for example, how do we see the opportunities and challenges of cities around the world and what we do? If you look at the, if I go back to the framework a while ago, um, in many of the cities, one of the challenge is how, first one, looking at the, the, the laws and policies, how do you make sure that these cities, which are under countries, which have ratified the CRPD or the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, how are they able to localize, put it in their, in their own context, the different principles and uh, articles of the CRPD? That's one of the challenge. And we have a lot of opportunities in doing that through our work. Um, second, if you look at the, um, the capacity, one of the challenges that, that we have is, of course, many of the cities would say, we don't have the, the resources, we don't have the budget. But uh, if you look at inclusive design, and if you look at, um, uh, universal design and accessibility, most of these cities would need only about 1%, additional 1% from the budget, from their budget in creating infrastructure um, to make them accessible, just 1%. It's a big problem for many cities now because when they try to look at their environment, we say, oh, we have to change uh, our physical environment. We have to make it more inclusive. The problem with that is most of the infrastructure, the current infrastructure we have are not accessible. And in order to make them more accessible, you have to add uh, about 20% more from the original budget. So it becomes very costly. Second, uh, when you look at the um, administrative and coordinating capacity of many cities, there is still some uh, challenges for many. Some would have existing um, agency that focuses on that, on you know, creating inclusive policies and implementing them. But because you have different issues under disability, it cuts across issues of employment, education, social protection, health, uh, an accessible environment, 
there are a lot of stakeholders you have to consider. And that becomes uh, sometimes one of the challenges. And that's where we also come in. We, we, we want to help uh, our partner cities and organizations be ready whenever that opportunity comes for them to make some changes. Um, the last one is the context, which is also one of the most important part. Um, some cities, when you look at the executive support, the support of the local leaders, many of them have the will, uh, the political will to make some changes, but many of them also do not know what to do. What should we do next to make our policies inclusive? What should we do next to make our programs inclusive? That's one of the challenge. And uh, our campaign is also trying to, um, trying to address that issue. And the last, two, the last two components of the context is of course, trying to make sure that uh, people with disabilities are able to participate and try to change that attitude. And one way we do that is trying to um, convene all the stakeholders, trying to develop a, 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 uh, a knowledge hub of um, network of networks so that people anyone involved and, and interested in creating inclusive policies for people with disabilities would be able to access the different resources. So these are the things that uh, probably you would have to remember uh, or actions that you can take. One, of course, uh, anyone can join the, the campaign. Uh, you can join the Cities for All campaign uh, as an individual or as an organization or even as a city. And uh, you'll be able to help uh, probably also work, work with us and analyze and align, uh, try to help cities align their local uh, responses to uh, the SDG 11 um, on cities, on making cities inclusive. Um, the other thing that we're trying to do now is trying to develop this uh, inclusive cities index. So we're trying to collect data and carry out research that we'll be able to share uh, good practice of different cities. And also, we, we also try to help identify the emerging issues through this data. What are the issues of people with disabilities? Uh, and we have to also document the lived experiences of persons with disabilities and older persons. Finally, uh, one of the good things that came out of the Cities for All campaign is we're trying to create a knowledge hub for network of networks between cities and stakeholders. So hopefully you can join us and thank you very much. Uh, good morning and good afternoon uh, again to everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much to Pong Cruz for that very interesting presentation. We'll move on now to our second panelist, Rizno Otami, and then we'll get some chance to um, for the panelists to respond to some of the questions that the students already posed to them, and then some space for open discussion. So for now, I'd like to hand over to Rizna. Thank you, Julian. <laughs> it's very uh, honor I'm invited in this uh, discussion. Uh, can I share the slide? So I have about seven or eight slides to share. Yes, please. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I'm the, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I can, I think, can you see all, all of the slide that I show? Yes, we can see it. Okay. You might want to go to full oh, screen, sorry. but it's yes. done. Wait, wait, yeah, I'll do that. Um, I'm just going to present. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, first of all, I would like to uh, greet everyone, including uh, our colleague in the uh, UN Enable, uh, Pong Cruz. I think it's very nice to see you here again. <laughs> and uh, when he's talking about about uh, the principle of the uh, inclusive city, and I would like to uh, bring you all to look at 
uh, the case study in Yogyakarta and how we are trying to uh, linking global uh, flood platform in this case of the uh, new development, I mean, new urban agenda uh, is also linking with the sustainable development goals 11 and how we implement it at the local level. So uh, first of all, uh, our colleague Victor Pineda, which is also a uh, Pong Cruz friend, uh, that we are together at the Diet, Disability Inclusive and Urban Accessible Development. And uh, when we look at the urban problems, I think the problem is not because of the person, because we are, for example, I'm a wheelchair user. It's not because I'm a wheelchair user, I cannot uh, access the environment, but because of the way uh, the, the environment is designed, that's why I cannot get around. And I think this is the important quote that I uh, get from Victor Pineda, how important for all of the planners, architects, they must engage with the diverse set of people with disability and how uh, uh, their participation is very critical in terms of determining the uh, universal design and how we can monitoring the mechanism of the urban development. So in this case study in Malioboro, uh, this is the situation of our city when where I live in Yogyakarta. Malioboro is a pep very popular destination for the tourists and also for local people to, uh, you know, uh, to enjoy Yogyakarta. So we have all kind of art and craft and, and other, you know, sort of like uh, art and culture performance in this area. And this was in 2000, uh, between 2001 and 2005, when uh, all of the accessible facility, uh, which is here is the guiding block that basically I was part of the designer on how to put the guiding block in, in this uh, area. But again, because of the, um, lack of socialization about the importance of accessibility and uh, people just using this uh, curb cut or pathway for parking lots. So this is part of the problem that we found and it's part of our advocacy ongoing since 2001 until now. And uh, it increased, uh, you know, the participation of persons with disability to improve uh, how Yogyakarta can be accessible. And uh, basically what we are doing, uh, in this case, I'm working with my organization, OHANA. So with OHANA and other coalition of organization of persons with disability, we are trying to uh, work with uh, diverse community, including the architect school at the University of Gajah Mada to create a, sort of like a, the first campaign, the second is budget advocacy, and the other thing is a policy review for Yogyakarta to become more accessible. So I would like to flash back in 2014 when we formalized, formalized the law on persons with disability. So in this uh, provincial law, the government require to achieve accessibility in our uh, district level and also the provincial level by 2024. That's why we are doing the uh, policy review on Jogja Accessible 2024 and we are creating the roadmap on how uh, to make Jogja accessible by 2024. And by doing this, we are not only working on the policy review, but also we are doing on the budget advocacy on how we can uh, create recommendation for inclusive ur urban programming to be more accessible for people with disability. So we basically, we do uh, several steps here and we are trying to find and identify the bottleneck, what, what is the problem and what is the big barriers for making uh, Jogja inclusive for all. And uh, not only that, we also create uh, like alliance. So we we work with other CSO working on uh, environment and also working on uh, uh, disability rights and inclusion. So we are trying to have an annual campaign in every year before COVID-19 pandemic hit Indonesia. Of course, we have annually a campaign and then 
in 2018, the government basically they uh, increased the budget for improving accessibility until 40 billion in that year. So I think it was a great, uh, good example to see how Malioboro now is more accessible. Now uh, we have a curb cup that it's more accessible, so people are not, uh, you know, using the curb cut or the pathway as their uh, parking lot, you know, for bicycle or for either a uh, motorcycle. So now we have more organized uh, city, I would say, and it's more friendly uh, for older people, for pregnant women, for people with disability, even to uh, enjoy the shopping, you know, at, at this marketplace. It's called uh, Pasar Bringharjo. And it's very nice and uh, comfy. Uh, so even the tourists, local or international, we, they can enjoy because now we have a better uh, city, especially in Malioboro. So I think what uh, Pong Cruz said about participation is becoming the key on how to uh, increase and also improve uh, accessibility and uh, urban planning that is very critical. And I think we are doing it, it's ongoing. It's never, you know, stop until now because the government still wanted us to give evaluation uh, and also monitoring what's going on uh, about the development of the accessibility in Malioboro. We also trying to design the uh, stair lift in, in one of the public uh, toilet uh, in Malioboro. And this is brand new, it's about two years ago. And uh, I was one of the one, the only woman with disability that was become the jury to design Malioboro. And it was very uh, important uh, how the government involved us as a woman and also disability and in terms of uh, designing uh, our city. And why it's important? Because basically we can prevent uh, violence against women with disability happens in, in all of the public spaces. And I think this is without uh, involving women, especially women with disability in all of this design, I think uh, we still, it's hard for, you know, for avoiding the violence in the public spaces. But the government uh, finally follow what uh, my suggestion. Uh, so we we are trying to make sure that the lighting in this uh, stair lift at night is completely you know bright, and then also uh, uh, the maintenance for this accessibility in Malioboro also uh, has to be maintained uh, because we know that the maintaining uh, cost is is very important for the government. Sometimes they just taken for granted for not trying to, you know, uh, manage the cost on how to maintain all of the public facility to become more accessible and all, and plus it has to be clean, especially this pandemic. So this is all of the design that we create all together. And uh, we basically working with uh, 101, not only with the Ministry of Public Works, but also with the university especially the architect school of Gajah Mada. And we are not only stop here, we, we still working on with, uh, developing curriculum with the Gajah Mada University to teach uh, students to learn about what is accessibility and human rights. And until now, I still teaching at the architect school of, uh, in Gajah Mada University about accessibility and universal design. And I think that is very important to understand and how to repli replicate what we do in Malioboro in other city. Uh, the importance of the participation of persons with disability, including women with disability, and how to uh, learn from other community, especially that when we talk about Malioboro, we design it. I have to also work with the guy that working with the parking lot, all of the uh, community that works to have that they actually sell their uh, produce and in, in the uh, pathway so it's like the food stall people that they basically provide the food stall and other uh, you know like a market traditional market so we are basically trying to learn from each other in order to create uh, accessible city and 
finally, this last picture is actually the, this is the first time in our district and Sleman when we can do the uh, WCMA, which is a, a sport wheelchair program that we can play the like a skateboard, but we are using wheelchair. So we finally can have this accessibility in the city so we can uh, sport, we can do the sport, we can play with other uh, people uh, without disability. So this this was really fun. And uh, it's not just because of the design, but also influence our mental health. So if people with disability can get around, it means that their mental health is also be maintained uh, in a proper way. Because if you know that uh, without accessibility and reasonable accommodation for people with disability, we, we are basically are, you know, being isolated to participate in the, uh, in the public and also in the community. So I think uh, that's the case study that I can share with you. And I hope that it can trigger uh, the questions or maybe other uh, uh, something that maybe raised you question how we did it with the government and how we are trying to involve people with disability in terms of uh, improving accessibility. And until now, actually, we are still working with the government. So now we are approaching the parliamentarian in Yogyakarta province to implement the roadmap of Jogja Accessible 2024 because the government should provide the budget and we will help to improve the design and then we also will have to do the monitoring and evaluation uh, by the 2024. Thank you. Um, well, thank you so much to Rizna, um for that wonderful presentation and thank you also to Pong for his wonderful presentation. So um, I'm very happy with the way the two presentations fit fit together. I think they complemented each other beautifully. Um, so both Pong and Rizna started off by presenting an understanding of disability, which made it very clear that disability is not primarily an attribute of the individual about the impairment itself or the functional limitation, but disability is much more a social process of disablement which is a really important point that they're making straight away because that's saying disability is a process of political claims and something which should be challenged at the societal level. And they then both went on to talk about initiatives to do this. And actually, originally, I think we had Rizna as the first speaker and Pong as the second. And I'm very happy by chance that it happened the other way around because I think the order was beautiful because Pong was talking about a global process to try and move forward this political process of challenging socially disabling processes at the city scale through this um, Cities for All Global Compact. Um, and looking at that, I think a really important point he made is that often these kind of advocacy political processes focus very much on policy change as the outcome. And he made the very important point that actually policy change is crucial. So for example, the victories of uh, getting the CRPD, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities has been crucial, but, and, and at his level, he's talking about the cities for all the vision, the sort of policy outcomes there. But actually, without what he called context and capacity, without the ability to implement those policy principles and make them relevant to particular contexts, they're less meaningful. Um, so I think that was a really important point that Pong was making about the movement from policy rhetoric based on policy victories to the actual realization of those policy goals. Thinking about that then, Rizna get a very interesting example of how this has played out as a process of political contestation in the case of Yogyakarta as a particular city. So she started from the um, the city scale law on persons with disabilities. And Yogyakarta is a very interesting case because it's an autonomous municipality within Indonesia. So it has a bit more freedom. And actually they've been very interesting and progressive on disability related policies. But she then made the point that that policy in itself was not enough 
without, for example, the advocacy that um, OPDs like Ohana are doing around budgets, around saying, if we have the policy, we need to finance this. And also things like, for example, um, the socialization process. So saying, when we have these guiding lines and drop curves, how do we make society actually use them properly and respect them as a really important resource? Um, and I think a final point that Rizna made, which I thought was really interesting in terms of this relationship between policy and the implementation of policy, was also the feedback of policy. So actually talking about the experience of implementing this and talking about people like herself who represent disabled people from a lived experience, actually feeding back into that policy process and giving their lived experience and learning in terms of refining and moving forward with that policy. So thank you so much for two wonderful presentations, which I think made some really important points about the politics of disability at the city scale and actually some of the really concrete strategies for implementing that. So thanks so much. Um, we now have some space to, for um, Pong and Rizna to answer some questions which were posed in advance by the students. I think some of them they've already dealt with in their presentations. So I'm going to throw it open to them. And if they tell me which question they'd like to speak to now, I'll bring it up so everyone can see it and they can talk about that. So. Um, as Rizna's been speaking more recently, should we start with Pong? And can you say, Pong, which questions you'd like to talk to? And then I'll bring them up on the screen for everyone to see. Yes, uh, okay. So the first one is on the one from group six. Uh, uh, that we have found in... So I don't yeah. have the number, so just tell me which what it was about. So we have found that in our interviews in, uh, that people with disabilities, uh, the one with, with hearing impairment. Yes, you can carry on. I'll just put it up on the screen, but you can start talking to it. So uh, can I read it aloud again? So we have found that in our interviews that, um, sorry, I lost it, okay. So we have found that in our interviews that um, specifically for people with uh, hearing impairment, uh, physical accessibility, uh, urban infrastructure, for example, ramps, uh, um, guiding blocks, uh, Etc. are not really a um, problem. Uh, probably because of the lack of accessibility to uh, information and services. So I go to the main question. So most. Uh, how? Sorry. Okay. So the question is how do you uh, think? an effective uh, distribution of information can be emphasized more in city scale planning? And what can uh, organizations of people with disabilities of the communities can, uh, can do to promote, um, to promote this? So one of the things that I, um, I've always, uh, I've been seeing for the past year and the past uh, more than more than a year now, uh, like here in the Philippines, is that access to information has been very important, especially in an emergency like a health crisis that we have right now. And many of the uh, news entities and, and also public uh, sector have recognized that. Uh, we've seen, for example, here in the Philippines, more of the news about COVID having sign language interpretation. And at first, I think the first time I, I saw it, I thought it was just one time. Um, maybe some organizations um, sent a note to uh, the different uh, news entities, and then they told them that 
you know, you, if you want your information to be accessible, you have to put some sign language interpretation. And eventually I, I saw that there are more and more uh, use of um, sign language interpretation in different programs. And that's one good sign, uh, a good sign that people are becoming more aware. And usually it takes some larger issues that might be, uh, that might impact not only people with disabilities or people who are hard of hearing, um, but also everyone for something as important as sign language interpretation to become adopted by different cities. And um, in some cities that we, we work with, and also when it comes to um, carrying out webinars and, and seminars, what we try to practice is, of course, using the sign language interpretation whenever we are conducting uh, these kind of webinars. And in one way or the other, this helps uh, stakeholders who probably are not involved in disability issues, but because they see that this becomes like a staple or a standard for an event to become an inclusive, uh, that's one way that we're able to promote the need for these kind of uh, um, assistive technologies or uh, the use of sign language interpretation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Pong. So perhaps, Rizna, would you like, and then we can go back. I know Pong had some comments on more questions, but Rizna, would you like to step in in relation to one of the questions? And if so, which one would you like to talk to? Yes, I would like to answer the question number two. What are the most challenging factors hindering women with disability from active participation in the community? And I think this is very important that we're, what we are doing here in Yogyakarta because uh, the way we can, uh, and I can share about some initiative that what we do in, uh, that we do in, in Malioboro especially. So it's, it's very interesting to work with women with disability because, you know, in between people with disability, we are more inferior than other, you know, with with other men with disability. So that's why the uh, on how to make women with disability speak out is very difficult because of uh, so many factors. So the the other thing is because um, about the education and also about uh, I would say about the education and also the limitation of participation in terms of mobility and also uh, the technology, uh, especially for the deaf women. They cannot participate because they don't want to participate because there is no uh, sign language in the practice, interpretation, for example. And also for women with disability and a wheelchair, it's not because uh, they don't want to talk about it, but also because of they cannot get around in order to participate in the meeting, for example, instead of education that I mentioned earlier. But I think uh, based on the CRPD principles, the disability is has been created because of the limitation of the participation, not because of our disability. That's what I would like to emphasize. And uh, the initiative that we are uh, working on uh, to improve Malioboro uh, development on accessibility is uh, we uh, we are doing like annual campaign so we we are doing a wheelchair parade every every February so every Valentine's Day <laughs> I and my other uh, women with disability that they are belong to uh, organization uh, we are initiated to have a wheelchair parade so we have to walk from uh, the beginning of Malioboro Street until the end of the Malioboro Street, back and forth. So that was, and we are singing using the sign language. So it was really a fun activity. And that was a good, you know, uh, example that we can promote because we are involving not only just women with disability and a wheelchair, but also the deaf community 
and they are also women and then uh, we are trying to deliver the message and after we have a wheelchair parade and then we finally have a dialogue with the parliament and government at the same day and uh, it was a it was a good strategy and initiative that we are doing uh, sort of like intervention from the community trying to improve accessibility in the city and and i think that uh, the participation is uh, really the key and once again the uh, the approach or the human rights based approach that we are trying to promote to the government that accessibility is part of uh, uh, human rights and has to be implemented by the state which is the government and and they agree uh, while we are trying to uh, convince the government that accessibility is uh, human rights and uh, we are so happy because women with disability they are very in their representative organization they basically trying to um, give ideas on on how to promote accessibility in terms of um, how to prevent violence in the public space we, we also trying to promote that issue with the government because we also concerned about the lighting in Malioboro is is very poor and then this is also a good uh, inputs that we also give to the government and we are trying to uh, again and again uh, do the monitoring and evaluation for the government voluntarily and then also ohana trying to provide opportunity and space for women with disability in uh, the representative organization in Yogyakarta to continue give the inputs their experience uh, how to access Malioboro and also uh, public transportation for example because this is also uh, the important part of making our city accessible is the transportation I hope I can answer the question <laughs> thank you Julian Thanks very much, Rizna. I think you definitely answered the question. So, Pong, would you like to respond to one of the other questions? Yes, uh, let me go to um, the question. How do you make locals and community members understand the meaning of um, inclusive planning? And how do you motivate people to participate in the planning and development process? So I'll, I'll go back with the concept of using data. And I think for your students here, using, trying to get as much as possible robust data on disability, uh, disaggregating the data that you find and using that to influence others is very important. So when you, for example, get some uh, data on people in informal settlements and get information on how many people with disabilities there are in, in, this, in these settlements, how many of them are women, uh, based on, you know, disaggregate the data by sex, gender, uh, age, uh, income, and of course, disability, functional limitations. That's very important because most of the time when you try to convince policymakers and try to convince uh, ordinary people. You have to give them sometimes, or most of the time, numbers. And another important part of using the data is trying to develop your message in a way that is understandable for everyone. Um, and that's a challenge for, for almost everyone here, uh, probably for researchers, when we write uh, academic papers, they have a lot of import, important information, important data. Um, and what we need to do is try to uh, bring the message into, uh, put out the message in an easy to understand format. In a way you're making message accessible uh, for everyone, for, for people with disabilities and also for the general public. So. Yeah, uh, I guess uh, probably Rizna would, would have some more uh, inputs on this. Thank you. Thanks for that, Pong. And I have to say to everybody that um, I just read a contribution for the UCLG, the United Cities and Governments um, 
uh, gold report around disability and inclusive cities and Pong gave me feedback that mine was using too much academic jargon and wasn't understandable for some of the city leaders. So it's a very important message and one that I'm glad he's emphasizing. Um, Rizna, did, did you have another question that you wanted to speak to? Yes, uh, I think uh, it's also incorporated with the answer that uh, Hong just mentioned about inclusive planning and how to create the scale up, uh, scale up bottom up strategies. Uh, I, I think it's very important to, uh, it's a question number four. And I think it's very important to have uh, same understanding about inclusive planning because uh, some people think that people with disability are as part, of, as part of the group that is not important to be included if they don't know about the inclusive planning and but even also the government it's it's hard to you know to be convinced before the era of the convention on the rights of persons with disability ratified by the indonesian government but but i think that um, we need to use the legal, uh, sort of like a legal uh, justification, which is the law that require about the inclusive planning and also uh, how to create participatory in the planning and development process. Because in Indonesia, we have a policy uh, that should uh participate all of the stakeholders and groups in the planning and development process so we we basically have a forum from the village level district level provincial level until the national level about the development a uh, consultation planning and and uh, implementation so we basically utilize that forum we also utilize the network we have in order to uh we participate uh participate in the planning and development uh, forum in Indonesia. Even, even though in the village level, we still can uh, participate in, in that level. And one, one of the good practice that I can share with you about the inclusive planning is one of actually several villages already, they create inclusive village where their community leader uh, basically support uh, people with disability organization to improve their village to become more accessible and they are using the village budget how to improve their village to become more accessible and and i think this is the way we do the uh, uh, scale up bottom up the strategy how we work from the village and then going up to the next level and uh, this is sort of like a good example. And finally, the government gets that initiative, so become the national initiative, become the uh, inclusive city, something like that, that are being developed by the government. And I think that uh, the way we uh, increase participation of the local community, that's that's part of the strategy that we can do to create the, the bottom up scale up bottom up strategy and and because this is kind of uh initiative that uh the indonesian government trying to implement it i don't know since when but i think since we are adopting the decentralization system that means every single uh territory uh, from the village level until the national level they have to have a participatory planning and the development but when we talk about the challenges, of course, we are dealing with the accessibility. Uh, Ohana was also observing uh, through our project in uh, several cities that um, when the government invite people with disability and their representative organization, they do not provide accessibility and, and the meeting venue also the reasonable accommodation for example the way uh, people with disability you know travel from their home to the city hall it's there is no such thing they have to uh, come there by themselves without any uh, support and the second is about the sign language interpretation 
we don't have such thing that such thing that the government provide for us so deaf community can participate in the meeting so that's some challenges that uh, are still happening in our uh, city planning and development meetings that basically happen annually in uh, every level of uh, the development in Indonesia. And the important aspects of, of doing this, I think that uh, I'm back a little bit about the scale up and the bottom up strategies is uh, we can share the good practice from from other fillets to another fillet, you know, from other province to other cities, something like that. And that this happened very, uh, I think it's uh, it's happened in, in a very good way because Kota Kita also promote the inclusive city in Banjarmasin and also Ohana working on in other uh, different sector, which is we are trying to increase participation of people with disability in, in the city planning and, and development, we call it Musrenbang. So this is very important uh, how we can, you know, combine and compile each other in terms of uh, increasing in initiative from the community and also uh, increasing their participation by providing accessibility and uh, reasonable accommodation. But again, we have to work uh, together <laughs> collaboratively. Yeah. Thanks so much, Rizna. So I think making the really important point there that disability inclusive city planning initiatives, the importance of them linking into mainstream participatory planning structures and not just being seen as a separate extra thing. So I think that's a really crucial strategy. Um, Paul, did you have a, another question you wanted to speak to? Uh, so before I go to the next question, I wanted to add a, uh, one thing yes, more, please. Uh, for that question. Um, one thing that I find very important when we're trying to scale up something, uh, especially on the issue of disability and human rights, is uh, trying to start with the family. You try to involve your families and your friends. Tell them about disability. Tell them about accessibility. Teach them about universal design. Uh, because I find that most of the time when you want to reach more people, one of the first advocates that you're going to have are your family members. And you, we know that it's very important in, in most of our, like Indonesia and the Philippines, uh, family support is, is something that we value so much. And like in my family, I try to teach my, my wife uh, and my family members talk about disability, how it is, what is the best way for them to engage in me, how to make me feel that I don't have a disability. And that's, that's what, uh, and it works. When I'm at home, I don't feel like I don't have a disability. And that's because the environment is enabling enough for me to walk, uh, to move around without any assistance. And they know when uh, or how to give me that assistance that I need, when I need it. And when I go out uh, and also for my family members, they, they use that. The knowledge that they learn, that they get from me, uh, they apply that in their work uh, and also when talking to other people. And I think that's one, one way we can uh, scale up uh, our efforts. Start with the family, start with your friends, and eventually it goes up. And you see a lot of um, political leaders, policy makers, starting to work on uh, disability issues because they have family members who experience that or they probably experience it through their friends. So in a way you see that disability uh, impacts more people and if you are able to convince other people, your family members, then you've somehow won the, the, the challenge of you know, trying to uh, scale up the, um, the, the process of making your policies and programs more inclusive. So um, I wanted to also highlight one of the other question um, on, hang on, uh, yeah about the question on uh, for for people with visual impairment 
So the question is- Okay, uh, I'll move to that. Right. So the question is given that uh, the perception of visi uh, visually impaired persons of our built environments, built environment uh, is distinct to that of people without uh, visual impairment. What can we learn from uh, visual impaired, visually impaired people uh, perception of, of the city? And how can that impact um, city planning? And I'm very interested in this in this specific question because um, I myself am legally blind. And um, I find that in my discussion with some of my peers uh, working on no, no, transportation no, no, no. accessibility, sometimes they think they have covered the issue that people with, uh, people with visual impairment or who are partially sighted, uh, they've covered it in their in the discussion of, of accessibility. And one takeaway with this, with this uh, question is that when we look at disability, there are nuances. There are different, there are more details that we can find when we talk about disability. The perception of, let's say, people who are blind is different from the perception of people who, who are partially sighted, uh, like me. I don't use Braille, um, but a lot of people think that when you talk about you know, legally blind people or people who are partially sighted or uh, visually impaired, they have to use blind, uh, they have Braille. And uh, that's one probably misconception that, uh, that they have. Uh, so one solution is of course, they try to promote uh, universal design and accessibility in order to consider you know, all the different uh, types of disability. And I guess it's, it's always important that you engage whenever you talk about um, city planning and development, local governments, and of course, organizations like uh, Kotaki that promoting disability rights. It's important that we engage every uh, uh, member of the disability community. Not only people who are partially decided, uh, but everyone. Because uh, each of these members of the disability community would have uh, probably a unique perspective on what works for them and what doesn't work for them. So thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm conscious of the time and it would be nice to have some space for open questions. Um, just before we move on to that, Rizna, did you have one of these you wanted to answer or are you happy to, to, to go to open questions from the audience? Uh, I just would like to emphasize one thing about what Pong said about the family support. Absolutely, and, uh, Yes, I think that's also one of the important aspects of how... Uh, you know, people with disability uh, that can make the change because without family support, uh, it's very difficult for even for me to move forward to get access to education, to get around, to be independent, something like that. So, so I think, yeah, from the family level is one of the important uh, aspect that we need to consider about how to scale up, uh, especially when we, when we talk about, you know, urban planning because this is part of how we visualize our future <laughs> how we can be independent uh, to live in the city so uh, even me i have to move from the big city from the village when my parents live so i think it's part of uh, the way we're trying to uh, approach and don't forget about the, the family level thank you Great, thank you. So I think it's an important point that independence is important, but interdependence is also important and being part of a family or another caring structure is a really important thing for everybody. So I'd like to throw things open and see if anybody has any questions they'd like to pose to the panel. We have about 10 minutes left. Um, either you can put your hand up or if you have a question that you want to put into the chat box, that would be great as well.
or if people are feeling too shy, we can go back to the existing questions that we have, but I'll just give a minute or so for anyone who wants to jump in with a question. Hi, Julian, I think uh, just also a quick notification in some areas, uh, people are break uh, opening, break fasting, breaking their fast. So that may be uh, the reason for the slightly slow response. So, um, but yes, if, if we want to wait a couple of minutes more, just wanted to let everyone know that I think in some areas, some people are breaking their fast. So um, yeah. Okay, thank you. And it might also be that people are have already had all their questions answered by the very competent panel members who've, who've covered a very wide range of issues already. But um, unless we have any immediate questions then, were there any, um, any closing remarks, Pong or Rizna, that you wanted to make or any reflections on today's sessions and the wider question of operating at the city scale that you would like to close with? And in the meantime, anyone who has a question can pop it in the chat. Rizna. Yes. Uh, uh, actually, I have a question <laughs> regarding the research that you have. I, uh, it's very important how to connect between accessibility and assistive device or technology in terms of how we can create uh, an inclusive city. So how do you, um, I, I have to say, but how do you visualize and how what is the expectation uh the result of your research and, and develop the assistive devices or technology to support the implementation of the uh inclusive city or inclusive planning yeah thanks Rizna. so actually the wider program one of the sub programs is looking at inclusive infrastructure so specifically looking at city development in relation to assistive technology and also our intervention in indonesia is going to be looking at planning of public and community spaces and we want to have a strong focus on assistive technology in a number of ways one is that those spaces are usable by assistive by users of assistive products in the same way that you talked about about drop dropped curbs and guiding lines. So one thing is that the spaces are designed with AT use in mind for older people and people with disabilities. I think another thing is actually what role can assistive technology play in enabling people to be part of the planning process? So actually assistive technology as a tool to enable participation. Um, and I think finally, a really important dimension of inclusive spaces goes beyond accessibility in terms of the physical design of the space to other aspects of inclusion. So for example, the representation of users, so the social status and actually how AT users are viewed. Is it stigmatized or is it a valued thing and is it respected socially? So actually the representation of that space and the representation of AT users in that space. Um, but in terms of the inclusive infrastructure program, I can put you in touch with Michaela. She's doing a study again, I think in Solo in Indonesia. So it might be nice to put you in touch and I'm sure she'd love to hear your perspectives there. Um, Hong, did you have any uh, sort of final questions or comments or remarks that you wanted to make before we draw to an end? Sure. Um, so, well, before I, before I end, I wanted to say hi to Rizna. It's nice to see you again. Um, and I wanted to end with, with uh, the, um, the concept of technology. Um, and you made a very important uh, point that, you know, technology can be a tool for, uh, for us to achieve inclusion. Um, and one thing that we have to address, of course, is the, you know, the gap because technology moves fast. And um, the gap that we have right now is that some some people don't have access to assistive technology. And the second is that some people do not know how to use assistive technology. And I think uh, um, I encourage your uh, students uh, to use your research to find out how do you bridge this gap? 
How do you make sure that technology will be used by people with disabilities? Uh, probably um, also how to make sure that people around them would know how to assist them and probably be part of that uh, development, that change and how to use technology in, in the city level. So again, good luck and thank you very much for, for the, the time. Thanks, Pong. And um, Rizna, did you have any final remarks to make or? Yes, Julian. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad that we can share a lot of thought in this uh, session. And I think the final remark, I would say that uh, using the technology actually can uh, reduce the limitation of participation. And I agree with what Julian and Pong said about technology can help us, uh, especially for me, women with disability, to uh, be more part fully participate and, and having a meaningful participation in terms of city planning, for example. And then um, we have to utilize this technology since we are now moving to the digital era and because of the pandemic of course we have to maximize the technology for us so and i'm, I'm so happy that are now um, the participation of people with disability organization and this pandemic when we are doing training or workshop they still can join us and this is very important on how we keep on improving our technology to limit uh, barriers because we have disability to mobile and and also, uh, we can make a uh, change in our city. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. I wanted to just say finally, thank you again for everyone for this session, to the students for some very thought-provoking questions, and of course, to Pong and Rizna for some wonderful presentations, which talked us through the politics of disability inclusion right from the global scale of the CPRD down to the scale of intimate family relations and the politics of engagement there. So I've, I found a very interesting session and I just want to say thank you very much and perhaps because these online forums can be a bit strange and feel a bit impersonal, if everybody wanted to just um, maybe turn their cameras on and unmute and give a round of applause that the, um, that the panel can hear. So. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Thank, Thank, Thank you, everyone, for uh, participating and listening in the discussion. I think we had a lot of participants. Uh, at most, there was 100 people joining. Um, so thank you very much once again, and happy Breaking Fast for those who are Breaking Fast. And uh, hopefully, we'll see you again sometime soon. Thank you, everyone. That's a wrap. Bye. 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 Bye.